Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, this hell of a lot of people in here for an early talk, early hour talk like this. I believe that's what they call sold out, right? Um, yeah, uh, I really appreciate that, and I will hope you will learn something useful today. So, first off, let me introduce myself. My name is Roman, and I'm a technical artist. For the past 10 years, uh, I've taken part in a number of projects. Uh, you could see some of them listed on this slide. Uh, most of these projects are different genera and were for different platforms. That's raised my main ex this experience raised my main expertise, getting the desired visual quality on a target platform with the target FPS. Right now, I'm a part of the Ukrainian company called Fracture Byte. Our, <clears throat> uh, our team consists of skilled and talented developers that have years of experience with an Unreal Engine. We are official Epic Games support partners and are offering remote and on-site help for developers located in CIS and Europe. That said, I am presenting you an extensive analysis of the mistakes that we found to be common for a lot of developers. Please also mind that some of the information I will be sharing you, with you today could sound really obvious, but the it's there because we see developers keep doing these mistakes. We'll discuss render and content pipeline bottleneck, <coughs> bottlenecks, some non-obvious consequences of the obvious choices, as well as ways of avoiding and, miti and mitigating these issues. We'll also take a look at some content tips and tricks that will help you cut the real-time cost of your content uh, while still keeping or even boosting the visual fidelity. One important note before we start. None of the information, uh, none of the issues I will be talking today could, couldn't be treated as a 100% indicator that you have problem in your project. However, in conjunction with some heavy performance systems, they might become a headache on the later production stages. That's why these bits are so dangerous yet fantastic. So, let's start. Let's begin by categorizing the, the, most, uh, the most known optimization beasts. First one is an inflated memory. You might have been facing this beast closer to the better or release stages of the development when content just wouldn't fit inside the device's memory. Second one is a stolen milliseconds beast. Despite the, uh, its small size, this one is the most common type of abyss that developers are facing when trying to reach the tar target frame rate. The third guy is a fading beauty. Some of you might have been facing issues when all of the content pipelines seem to be correct, textures are more than HD, but the visual fidelity is not hitting the bar or just taking out even the high-end hardware. In this section, we'll talk about some tips and tricks that will help you hit that bar and not take out the roof. The last type of a beast is a blockbuster physics guy. Sorry, I couldn't find any suitable beast image to illustrate this type of issue. However, this guy is well known for breaking the rules of physics, right? The, this last chapter will tell you about some optimizations that should be taken into account when dealing with physics. That said, let's move on to the bottlenecks itself. We'll take a look at the memory-related issues on the first place. First topic here will be asset references. Some of you may know about the difference between hard references and soft references, but let me refresh, refresh it for the rest of the audience. Hard reference lots the asset in memory whenever it's present in script or code. Soft reference, on the other hand, just holds the path to the asset and only loads the, this asset when it should be played or demonstrated to the player. Tend to use soft references whenever it's possible. Okay, now when we've cleared all things with referencing itself, let's move on to the not that obvious consequences to this rule. First off, when you set an actual texture in a material, of actual texture of some game object in a, in a material, 
this texture will be loaded and stay in memory even if the base material isn't applied to any object in your scene. Uh, it will stay in memory even all of its material instances that are inherited from this material use different textures. The better decision would be to use a set of small default textures. You could see some of them that we are using in our projects. So we have the base black, basically the black, the base composite, uh, the base gray that, that uses the linear color space, base gray alpha that uses uh, the alpha compression, basically the one channel compression, no. Oh, so no, the base gray is just the gray. The base gray scale is the one that uses the gray scale compression. The base normal and the base white. We found these textures to be more than enough for pretty much every project, so free to use them. <coughs> another, another example of hard references is the UMG widget switcher. As you may know, this is a special type of a slate object that holds uh, several widgets and is able of switching between them. However, when using it, you must remember that widget switcher lots and holds in memory all child widgets all the time it's on screen. That means that all resources that are used by this widget will stay in memory as well. That said, use them wisely. Let's proceed with the textures. We frequently see developers that use non-power of two textures. You should really pay a lot of attention when using them. Let's take a look at why they are so bad. First off, they don't have MIP maps, which makes it impossible to use them in the world because, because they are subject to more array effect. Secondly, they are compressed badly in some cases, thus making their size enormous. Just take a look at this table. This table. Uh, this comparison table uh, shows the approximate sizes in memory. Uh, and I bet you see the. Oh. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Something went, went completely wrong. But, okay, let me. Let me kind of put it together. So you have the 520, uh, 512 by 512 texture. It, it weighs around 171 kilobytes. And the texture that has only one pixel more weighs like about 10 size more. So that's, I believe, the refreshing difference that you will feel right off. Uh, so the best, best practice was, would be not to use uh, would, would would be to use only square and power of two textures. Now let's take a look at different compression types available in UE4. Default method is a DXT compression, which is suitable for a wide variety of applications. However, when you, one could notice artifacts when importing some masks or channel packed textures. This situation needs you to stay cold blooded and not to increase the resolution of your texture. You might want to use another method of, of the compression that better suits your needs. You could see the force mip map of two textures that use different compression types. The one on the left is four times the size of the second one. However, it still has some compression artifacts clearly notice noticeable. The texture on the right utilizes the grayscale compression and is four times smaller without any noticeable artifacts. Now onto the shader permutations issue. You could see screenshots that unfolds the underlying structure of the material as it is compiled into the shaders. You need to know it to effectively optimize your materials based on the usage flags and material in inputs used. So for instance, if you plug in uh, just a constant color node into world position uh, offset input of a material and assign it to a skeletal mesh, m this material will, will produce 20 additional shaders. Every additional input that is not in the same shader adds additional shaders to compile. But not only inputs and usage flags generate additional shaders. 
You should also keep, keep an eye on the translucency and tessellation settings that you are using in your materials as they also generate additional shaders. The last step on the way of optimizing your memory consumption is a hard edge and UV seams management policy. Some of you may know that when you import mesh into UE4, you will get a lot more vertices uh, displayed in the static mesh editor statistics than in your 3D package. That's because UE4 splits edges of the mesh along UV seams and hard edges. That's not something better good. That's just an optimization for more effective real-time computations. So as a general rule, you would like to have most edges smooth and as few UV seams as possible. That way you will keep vertex count acceptable after import. Now let's get to the most wide topic. Optimizing content to regain milliseconds stolen by this little guy. Let's start with the colon systems, the most widely misinterpreted feature of the engine. A lot of developers rely too much on it, and some even think they don't need to manage level streaming because there are built-in colon systems. That's not right, and you should carefully design your levels with level streaming in mind. The screenshot on this slide shows that it took around 13 milliseconds to process 35 solvent occlusion queries, which is obviously too much uh, when most of them are just not rendered, right? I advise you to start thinking about the visibility colon uh, on the early stages of the development. You should try to imagine how big will be the vantage points on your levels and carefully plan amount of content visible from these points from these spots. You should also plan your level design so the level streaming will be effective enough not to pass redundant objects into the column system. Now onto the instance static meshes. The must-have optimization for open world games which could really become easily become a bottleneck. Let me recall how instancing works for those of you who are not familiar with this feature. Traditionally, we draw every actor as a separate object, which requires switching render states, loading shaders, etc. Instanced approach takes advantages of hardware instancing techniques that could render an array of identical objects in one draw call. Sounds simple enough, right? One could even say, okay, let's merge all identical meshes together, and we are good to go, right? Nope. You wouldn't. Merging o uh, your actors a lot will eliminate all of advantages of frustum and occlusion colon, which at some point will outweigh the advantages uh, of instancing. Here is the picture of a typical city downtown location. Developers have merged all small props into instance static meshes. The thing is that instead of being dropped out by colon system, all of these objects are being rendered any time player gets near the downtown location. Given the fact that the current gen graphics require a lot of textures and pretty complicated pixel shaders, all of the advantages of drawing these objects in one draw call are eliminated by the fact that the engine needs to draw all of them every time the camera sees only one instance. Of course, 4.22 engine introduced the auto instancing feature, so you don't need to manage these scenes by yourself anymore. But I know a lot of you guys are still on the earlier uh, versions of the engine, so that's a tip for you. There's also one last thing I'd like to say about instance static meshes. If your static mesh uses LODs, every LOD will be a separate draw call on the, on the GPU. And no matter of fact, are those instance, instances merged or not? Take this into account when profiling your game or planning the render strategy. What's wrong? It's not working anymore. 
Oh, so this this is the downtown location. Okay. <laughs> uh, I believe this this thing just just broken. Okay, <coughs> uh, material slots. As you may know, material slots in a mesh are actually drawn separately on a GPU. That means that placing six static meshes, each with one material slot, is basically the same as placing one static mesh with six material slots. You will not gain any performance improvements or disadvantages. However, if you will took a step forward and merge all of those materials into one, you could possibly shave off a couple of milliseconds from complex objects render time. You could also step up the game and shave couple mils shave couple milliseconds more by disabling cast shadows checkbox on the distant LODs of your props. This will effectively disable rendering of that part of the mesh in a shadow depth pass, which basically eliminates the need in an additional draw call for your object. There is also a common production mistakes mistake when meshes use the same material on several different slots. You should merge such, such slots immediately when you spot them. Okay, so much said about stress tests and the importance of sticking to the texel density that they dictate. Nevertheless, we frequently see developers that are making their textures four or eight times bigger. On top of that, some of that, some of them are not applying texture groups in, for their textures. First off, this entails a lot more work on optimization on the later stages of the development where the speed of iteration is crucial. Secondly, it turns out that without properly set texture groups, you are not able of making fast changes and control amount of memory that your game requires. Also, there is a third drawback that is not that crucial right now, but nevertheless should be talked about. Right now, in 2019, we have all these cool texturing packages that are able of generating textures based on procedural noises. However, if your content pipeline still relies on hand-painted textures, creating high-resolution textures might become a massive production bottleneck as this pixel pixels will be just thrown away on the final stages of the development. Now onto the shadow maps and stationary lighting. The existence of this bottleneck is well documented. However, we frequently see beginner developers that are for some reason not aware of it. I've took the definition of the feature from official documentation. Here it is. Each movable object creates two dynamic shadows from a stationary light. A shadow to handle the static word casting onto the object, and a shadow to handle the object casting onto the world. I believe you already know what I'm trying to say. Here is a common example. Setup that uses a lot of movable objects lit with a stationary light setup. Just take a look at the charts. They pretty much talk for themselves. That's the situation where the fully dynamic lighting almost, is almost twice faster than the stationary lighting. That said, use stationary light wisely and try to not waste precious milliseconds in vain. Okay, there is no such thing um, as making a mini, uh, as one way of ma making a minimap in your game. Each map, minimap uh, has its unique set of features, but GPS route is almost a must. Here's an advice for those of you who is developing this feature right now. We often see developers who use small plays, planes or cubes to render the path of the GPS route, which obviously takes a lot of draw calls, despite of the fact these draw calls are relatively cheap. Beware of such implementation and consider using splines to draw the for rendering of the GPS route. Okay, the draw calls, the holy grail of every tech artist that is struggling for every millisecond. Even the most cheap draw calls, like the GPS route, repeated a lot of times could become a bottleneck. There is a number of good practices that we'd like to share with you. 
despite the, uh, despite the fact that 3D and environment artists just love modular content pipeline, you should always think of whether, of whether is it good for your game's real-time performance. A rule of thumb here is merge every actor you could if you are heavy on draw calls, or split everything you could if your pixel shader performance is bad. When merging actors, you should always keep in, in mind the same concept about calling importance that we've discussed earlier in the instant static, meshes section, instant static meshes section. Here is an example from the browser Satellite of Tucson project that we've, developed, uh, that we've ported to the mobile. Despite the fact it was made on the US3, the same concept, concept still applicable for modern games. PC version utilized really modular level design, which we have optimized by merging a lot of individual objects into one. This advice might be crucial for developers that don't want to cut the content yet and want to try to optimize the complexity of their content without sacrificing the quality. The fact that each draw call will be executed with different speed is obvious, however, underestimated. With current gen graphics and trend on, ma and trend on making shaders more and more complicated, you should always be on guard and cut the draw calls that use the most complicated materials. You should also keep in mind that rendering will take longer time for objects that are closer to the camera because of the amount of the pixels they cover on screen. Here's an example. The translucent statue on the background is rendered much faster than big opaque rock piece on the foreground. Translucent material on the screenshot is really complex. It has around 900, 930 instructions in the base pass shader. While rock material has only around 170 instructions. Statue material is also using five more texture samplers. Nevertheless, statue is rendered almost seven times faster than the rock because rock is occupying a lot of screen space in this shot. That said, be careful and plan complexity of your materials based on the level of detail and distance from a player. This last advice might boost performance of your game right away. When you return to your office, try to search for movable shadow casting lights with huge radius. You'll definitely save a plenty of milliseconds by disabling shadows on such lights or limiting the number of objects that are casting shadows from it. In this example, one point light with attenuation radius set to 55,000 units took around 20 milliseconds to render its shadow map. It happens due to the fact that engine needs to draw each object casting a shadow from this light into a shadow pass. So the radius of the movable lights really matters. The last advice about using simplified materials on LODs is mostly a tip for those of you who are aiming at mobile platforms. Here is an example from the Life is Strange port that we've developed. Take into, into account that guys from Don't Not have used Blin Micro Facet almost on every surface in the game. It would be just impossible for current generation mobile platforms to render all of them. That's why we had to simplify materials for distance LODs and cut the big chunks of geometry into smaller ones so they will switch LODs more effectively. In order to hide seams that inevitably will pop out, on the edge of the simplified and original meshes. We used unlit materials and some vertex coloring to hide the transition between LODs on small props, trees, cars, and bushes. Simply put, we wouldn't ship this title without this optimization. Okay, the last thing in this section. It, it, it wouldn't be a revelation for you and seems to be an obvious thing, but again, we see developers do this. When everything else is optimized and it seemed that you couldn't get any millisecond more than you already have, try to check if something could be hidden. For example, all props, all props inside trunk of this car take one millisecond to render. 
they could be easily hiding when the trunk of the car is closed. Trust me, you wouldn't be more happy than when you gain one millisecond back by just hiding something. Okay, now let's dive into some tips and tricks on how to make the game look, uh, look better without hitting the performance. Okay, that's the most controversial one, so please save your rotten tomatoes for later on. I believe every one of you heard a catchy phrase for the real rendering. It's been used by marketing departments as a description of the visual advances of the games ever since I started playing video games. Oh, and my first video game was Quake 2, which basically looked like this just in case of some of you missed that beautiful software acceleration. But why I'm talking about this? The thing is, a lot of developers nowadays are really dedicated to the idea of photoreal rendering. However, the truth is, real-time rendering engines has little to do with loss of optics and physics. Of course, most of the rendering techniques were inspired by real-life observations, but the implementation of these features is far from being physically correct. Believe it or not, they are all just a set of intricate fakes covered in smoke and mirrors. Either way, we just wouldn't have an opportunity to render all these beautiful images with a speed of 30, 30 frames per second. I have attended a few talks yesterday that were focused around this topic. They were really good, and I'm not trying to say here that this approach is bad. What, uh, what, really what is really bad is that developers, some developers, start to misinterpret those workflows thinking of how it's made in real life. That said, let's run through the best practices. Here is the first example of developers being too devoted to photoreal approach. That's a situation with global elimination setup. A lot of developers spend weeks and days trying to find the best light mass settings or shoot the best uh, cube map for their IBL uh, lighting. I present you a well forgotten hotkey that instantly picks up the light color under the mouse pointer and creates a point light with this color. This way, you could add some fake bounce lighting just where you need it without spending hours for trial and error with light mass settings. If you have fully dynamic lighting, that's the, best, the, that's the best choice for you. I don't count light propagation technique or newly introduced uh, GI features of the agent as they are still experimental or not even cheap. Okay. Uh, we frequently see environment artists that are dedicated to the idea of photoreal lighting. They put their light sources as close to the actual light emitting point as possible. As you might guess, results are very dull. In some cases, bad lighting placement could even ruin the shape of your environment <coughs> or mislead the player. You could see such example in the screenshots. Setup on the top screenshot uses one point light inside kerosene lamp. The second setup uses two point lights, one to produce nice shadowing from the lamp and environment, while the other produces additional light to enhance the bounce lighting. None of these lights were positioned to be in the exact light emitting spot. It was tweaked to give the most interesting shadowing that emphasizes the shape of the environment. That said, tweak your lighting the way it will produce the most visually interesting results. Let your lighting be cinematic, not photoreal. Because as one guy said one time ago, the only difference between movies and real life is that the movies have better lighting. Let's now look at the materials and their relationship with photoreal rendering. As I said previously, a lot of artists tend to use real-life constants. There are also developers that are following straightforward logic. If the surface is completely smooth, I should set roughness to zero. These are two sides of the same kind. 
Relying too much on the real-life constants might not give you the desired results. For instance, setting the roughness to zero will just give you a pile of reflection artifacts because surface is too smooth for an engine. Using zero specularity will just produce unbelievable results because every material in the real world has a bit of specularity term in it. Take a look at this cut snippet. Artists could take a look at the simple sheet below that shows results of this computation. Setting metallic to one will make your diffuse be fully black, while base color, color will replace the specular color. This will not immediately make your visuals bad, but will definitely leave a mark on them. Always test your content in engine and tweak your materials and textures from an artistic point of view. In other words, if it looks like you want, it doesn't matter how you get there and how physically correct were the val values that you've used. Every artist wants to use the maximum polygons and pixels possible to show off his skills and, uh, and make great looking model. Sometimes this leads developers to a conclusion that they need more complex shaders. Try to resist and double check if there is some fake you could apply. Here is another example from the Life is Strange project. Okay, we have no internet. Uh, okay, I will talk you through this video, okay? Uh, high school location had a lot of classrooms available for players to explore. On top of that, Every classroom had a door with a glass window that gave an opportunity to see through them. We couldn't afford this location to be actually loaded on mobile, so we've moved them in a separate levels when the player is in corridor. We replaced complex translucent material used on the doors with opaque and lit material. It used pre-captured cube maps from PC version that imitated the presence of the room behind the glass door. We have also used slightly modified version of this technique to optimize our door location seen from the windows in indoor scenes. The only 3D objects left in these outdoor scenes were the ones closest to the windows as well as ground plane. Everything else was baked into cube maps. The last topic about the photoreal fans is the approach to textures. So the thing is, if you will make your albedo textures too dark, you will, you will not be able to get the full dynamic range of the final image. That means that without tweaking eye adaptation or tone mapper, you will not get enough light in your scene. Even if you add these effects, dynamic range of your lighting will be poor, thus making lighting look flat and cheap. You could see that anything is barely visible on the top screenshot, while the one on the bottom is doing a pretty good job in depicting light gradients even inside shadowed regions. So how dark is too dark? Generally speaking, luminance peak of your albedo textures should be around 0.73 value in Photoshop since it uses gamma space. However, that's not true for any situation, and as any rules, this one has exceptions. Example could be black obsidian rock on a bright sunny day. In that case, you will have to make your albedo textures pretty dark while pulling the specular, specular reflections to get the sense of a bright sunny day on the surface. Now let's talk about the PBR texture approach. We often see developers that try to pack physically correct values right inside their textures. Let me tell you why it's bad. First off, none of the texturing applications sh share the shaders with the Unreal Engine. That means that model could look ideal in the, in the application, but might not look the same in, in the engine. Secondly, material could look weird at certain lighting conditions. For instance, if you have not checked your model, 
uh, how your model looks like in a night scenario, you might be really surprised. That's why we recommend to always add multipliers to roughness, metallic, and specular inputs of your materials. This way, you will have fast and comfortable controls for tweaking the look inside the engine. The last topic uh, about art-related issues. We frequently see developers that are not paying a lot of attention to the depths of the scene. Of course, I'm talking about the aerial perspective and fog. Even clear sunny day has a little bit of fog in the air, making distant objects less contrast. I can't stress more how important fog is for a perception of the depths of the scene. That said, apply some fog to your scene and resist to any impulse to replace fog with depths of field. That happens sometimes because these effects aren't doing the same, the same thing. Okay, now on to the last chapter, the physics-related issues. <clears throat> you might be surprised by the fact uh, how collision complexity of the skeletal meshes could really make things worse. Here is a screenshot that demonstrates one of the marketplace assets in the game. This mesh has four convex body for each wheel. The game is an open-world project with a lot of cars like this driving around. As you can see, optimizing collision on the cars have lowered overall frame time almost twice. That said, paying attention to your collision complexity. Another, another advice for those of you who run a lot of simulated bodies in their games, like cars, physics bodies, etc., may be implementing a simplified movement technique that doesn't rely on the physical animation, uh, uh, physical simulation at all. Here is a screenshot demonstrating such optimization. As you can see, uh, disabling physics simulation on a passing by cars have lowered physics thread time almost five times. A lot of AAA open world projects use the same technique to simplify calculations on the distance. Consider this approach to gain that huge benefit in real time performance. Okay, now on to the last advice. That's not a common mistake, but sometimes developers forgot how expensive an overlap, overlap checks might be. You could see an example from an open world MMO game where overlap checks in blackboard graphs just stalled the physics thread. Avoid using overlap events that are checked for a lot of components in all collision channels. Use them wisely and do traces and overlaps separately only for channels that needs this. That's it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this talk and learned something useful today. You are now welcome to hit me with any questions you have. Thank you.